and we're live. Cool. Thanks for uh, for joining all. Um, I, as you might know, I'm not Ethan. I'm actually his his brother. Um, but um, as with all things with technology, as you are, uh, you need him to work the most. They uh, they decide not to. Ethan's uh, Wi-Fi cut out just about 15 minutes before we uh, started to go live here. Um, but in the meantime, he, he might hop on here. I'm gonna kind of introduce David and um, he'll kind of take us through um, the, uh, today's topic. Um, for that, yeah, the, David, is, uh, as some of you know, Hawkins, he works with students who are applying both um, internationally in the US and, and around the world. Um, so today, yeah, he's gonna talk a little bit about um, kind of giving a crash course for students that are interested in applying in the UK and, and applying to, uh, to Europe. Um, so let's uh, let's kick things off, David. You want to just kind of start with a little intro about your uh, about yourself, who you are, how you got into this, and uh, we can go from there. Absolutely, thanks, Devin. Hello, everyone, and Ethan, wherever you are, trying to find Wi-Fi. Hello to you. We hope we get to see you in a minute. Um, Devin's doing an amazing job with a very short bit of notice to grab a clean shirt and get presenting. So we'll make this work. Um, yeah, hello, everyone. My name's David. I'm director of the University Guys. Um, I'm based here just after midnight in wonderful England. Um, freezing cold, pitch black, but really excited to speak to you all. Um, my story, very similar to a lot of other people doing counselling, university advising. Uh, I was a teacher, graduate of St Hughes College at the University of Oxford in history, taught history for, for many years quite happily, picked up bits of university advising. Um, as we'll talk about, the model in, in the UK and in Europe is a little bit different. Um, ended up doing full-time counselling um, at the International School of Brussels, and now have been doing independent counselling um, with my team at the University Guys for a number of years. Um, and this year we've supported students with applications to 16 different countries. Um, so hopefully able to offer some advice tonight. Awesome. Cool. So, yeah, just to kind of kick us off, for a lot of the students that are, are tuning in uh, are looking primarily at schools in the U.S., but for those that are interested in applying to the U.K. and, and Europe, what are, what are what might be some of those reasons, what might be some of the kind of you know, the, the options that are available that might not be available in the US or might be yeah. different or better. Absolutely. I mean, I kind of want to, you know, this idea of a crash course sort of start off with like the big question of like, do you want to go? Like, do you actually want to go outside the US for, for college? Um, and some, some of those big picture reasons I think are really important. Before I do that, I'm going to, Devin, I was going to drop this on, on Ethan, but I'll do it on you. A really important question just to try and get you into the idea of, how college works differently in different parts of the world. So Ethan, if I asked you in a sentence to describe a sport called football, what is that word football conjuring up to you? What, what is the game of football to someone in the United States? Yeah, American football. But to me, that game of football is what you would call soccer. Right. Um, and the same difference between two words is completely different to how university works. It's a word which has different meaning in different parts of the world. Um, and so the big thing I wanna say is everything that, that all the guys joining us tonight might be thinking of in terms of how university works and how you choose a university and how you apply to university. I kinda of wanna imagine you're like Harry Potter with the pensive and you're taking that memory out of your head and dropping it down. College in other places beyond the US works differently and has different preconceptions. I think there are three big picture reasons why you might consider as a student from the States going to college in the UK or Europe. The first one, and I'll start out with the absolute you know, brass tacks, is it's a lot cheaper, significantly cheaper in many, many cases. Um, yeah, let me just run through a couple of options. If you're going to go to Trinity College Dublin um, in Ireland, tuition a year will cost you about 25,000 US dollars. If you're going to go to a university like Leiden in the Netherlands or Bocconi in Italy, teaching in English, despite them not being English speaking countries, you're looking at about 15 or 16,000 US dollars a year tuition. Or and this is one of my hidden gems, KU Leuven, the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, teaching English, world top 50 on the Times Higher Ed rankings, if you believe in rankings. It could cost you as little as 1500 US dollars to go to school in Belgium. So that's the option there. Ethan, you you made it. I feel like the, the host late to his own party and I totally am. So if you'll still have me, David, I'd love to join. <laughs> it's, you, it's, your, it's your show, my friend. No, yeah. <laughs> it's now your show. Devin, thanks for, for sitting in. Cool, awesome. I'll let you guys take it from here. All right. Thanks, so, so yeah, it's just a big picture. So cost, obviously. That, also, it's a year shorter. 
So that's another reason to think about it. Typically, college in UK or York is a three-year degree. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we have a three-year degree typically rather than a four-year bachelor's degree. Another one is the transparency of the outcomes. I mean, this is a big difference. And when I, we support UK students coming to the US, it's kind of hard to understand. We have very clear entry requirements for university here. So imagine if a school like Stanford or USC or Harvard or, or Oberlin said, you must have a 3.9 GPA and a 34 ACT. You can know what would happen to the entry rates in there. Well, that's how UK and European schools do it. So you can kind of predict with a much higher degree of accuracy where you might get in or not. So big picture, it's cheaper. It's going to probably be quite shorter. And actually, it's really quite predictable. And that's before you get onto all the cultural factors about how stretching it is to live in a different country and pick up another language and live more independently. And all those things are really true. But those are kind of really important things. I'll chuck in also in here, and this is a stat that maybe not a lot of people know, there are 774 non-US universities approved to use your US federal aid for. So even with those costs, you can get your US federal aid you would use at US school and use it at an international school as well. Mm -hmm. I love these. And I just want to slide in with you here. And speaking of those, some of those cultural differences, because I was somebody who studied in the US, studied undergrad, but then studied abroad in University College London, UCL. And it, it was different, you know, studying, there was a different vibe. I can share if that's interesting to folks, how it was different for me, but talk to us about some of those cultural differences. Yeah, I mean, it's all these things that, you know, you know maybe the food will be different and the language will be different or the accents will be different. And I've lived abroad, I've lived in, in Belgium. And then you know those big picture things. I think the really transformative things are the things you don't think can be different. So, for example, paying your taxes. You know, you're in one particular culture and you understand how it works. Then you're in another place and it's not better or worse. It's just different. Right. Um, the way you go and access healthcare, for example, um, all these little cultural things about, you know, what happens if you come two people are trying to enter a door from either side and how you relate to it that way. Um, I'll confess when I come to the States and, and hopefully after the pandemic, I'll be able to be back relatively soon. I kind of have to G myself up that when someone says good morning to me in an elevator in a US hotel, that they actually want to have a conversation. Um, because in the UK, that's, you know, good morning means don't ever talk to me. We're British and we're, we're just going to pretend we don't exist. So all these kind of things, it just it broadens the mind. Yeah, it really does. One of, the, one of the things I noticed, too, in terms of the academic differences, there's a lot of, at least at Northwestern in my undergrad, there was a lot of, I don't want to say coddling, but checking in with students. Whereas at UCL, it was a bit more like you do the work or you don't do the work. You're a bit more on your own. Now, I don't know if that's true in every university, but that was another sort of at least academically, a cultural difference in terms of the yeah. way. What? How would you say if you had to characterize? And it's hard to speak about all, you know, thousands of these schools. But in terms of, let's just talk about UK, and then I'd love to hear about UK versus, you know, say the rest of Europe. But how would would you say that that feels true, or what would you say are some of those academic differences? Yeah, I, I agree entirely, and, and this is kind of where I think there's a, a number of key reasons why actually it is a bit different beyond that kind of big picture so if you just like okay i like the sound of that i want to go well where do you want to go and this is where some of the choices come into it and that that big difference and where i said devon football versus football is mostly in the uk and europe you're actually going to university as a student of a subject you've applied to study mm -hmm. so it's, it's not like in the, in the us where maybe you're undeclared maybe you've applied in a particular school and a college maybe you've indicated an interest in a major in our system, pretty much everywhere, you are admitted to study a subject. So that means that you are already expected to have a certain level of knowledge at the time in which you apply. Hence why would testing work slightly different over here because they need to assess that you can actually walk in. And so because you've got that level of knowledge and you are just doing that, that subject you've been admitted to study, they can expect you to be more independent. Mm -hmm. because you don't have these exploratory classes you don't have these different things um yeah you know, i quite often find it fascinating to talk to people you know when i think back to my degree at oxford a hundred percent of my classes were history mm -hmm. and if i'd gone to northwestern how much history would i have done ethan over the i mean of probably i would say like 50 percent, maybe 60 if you were really intense about it but they really encourage you to take you know this that and the other and the in, even the conversations for me in the in the dining hall were very different because in the cafeteria at Northwestern, you know, people are taking such different things, but they're they're in similar classes. When I was sitting across the table from someone who's studying math or maths, as they say in the UK, <laughs> and and I'm studying theater, 
you know, we are having different schedules altogether, and they're studying in some cases a lot more uh, than I was studying. But in you know, whereas it might mix a bit more, I found that we were on pretty different tracks uh, yeah. when I was at UCL. And I think that's a really great reason for, for and the students we work with from the US, the university guys are the people who are going, you know, I, I just don't like gen eds. I don't want to do a core curriculum. I have found my thing mm -hmm. and that's what I want to go and study. And equally, the students that, that we work with, I know you guys work with, who want to come to the US is because they want to explore. They want to do a slightly broader curriculum. So, yeah, that is the big difference. You are going to university to do something, what we call like a single honours or a joint honours. And that culture permeates into everything. Um, and I guess the second reason then is that because of that, like the wonderful job of counseling for college fit, and you see some of the books behind me. If I've got yours up there, Ethan, um, you know, Our, about, you're in there uh, too. I'm little, little tiny bit there. <laughs> shout, shout out to Joan Lewis as well for being in there. But yeah, awesome. Um, but in the UK, fit is only academic. In Europe, in most places, fit is only academic because you're admitted to study history right. or business or French. You're not admitted to get to that community. And so that's another reason why it's different because. It doesn't matter what kind of person you are. You've just got to be really smart for the subject you're applying for and have the right test scores. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about how students figure out, how do students sort through where to apply in the UK and Europe, say? Yeah, well, this is where the US, kind of on a spectrum of like how hard is it to work out where you want to go to college. The US is way out there. I spend most of my days trying to explain to British families how crazy it is that you actually can't just work out in three minutes where you want to go. Um, so when you are investigating where to go, you're not really looking about the culture of the university you are first of all focusing on that course of study so that would be the first thing particularly in a system like UCAS the British application system which is one common application with no supplements it goes to every place you apply to so you're typically applying for the same subject across things so you're going to reference probably two data points the first one will be what do you want to study mm -hmm. and the second thing do I have the grades in order to enter that university and they're not necessarily a guaranteed entry but they will say for a levels for ib for us high school diploma ap's these are the grades you must have and if you don't have those grades you're not going to get an offer so that narrows your list down and therefore what you find is people will apply to a relatively narrow band based on their test scores you know, mm -hmm. either what they've got or they are predicting that they will go on to achieve once you've got to that list, um, you will then probably start to look at these other things like, do I want to be in a city? Which city? Do I want to be in the countryside? Do I want to be near an airport? Do I want to be somewhere where there's going to be a lot of international students? Do I never want to hear an American accent ever again? All those kind of things. I, I advise putting a Canadian uh, uh, like a badge on your backpack and just walking around. <laughs> that's, what I've, that's what some of my friends did because there were sometimes, you know, I don't know, negative associations with your folks. I wouldn't like to comment, Ethan. Why would people? I don't know why that would be. Uh, anyway, um, I, this is something that we might be talking about in the future, but I want to sneak in here because I think that it's something that's relevant and interesting and something that we've written about. It's on the blog. But how does that application in particular, that personal statement, differ from when they're writing for the U.S. versus when they're writing for the U.K.? Yeah, I mean, it fundamentally then comes down to this idea of what are you applying for? And I think you and I both, you know, when we do our, our essay work, you've got to know what this thing you're, you're going for is. Is it, you know, a small liberal arts college with a particular vibe? Well, in the UK, you're applying for a subject. Mm -hmm. So what you write, and bear in mind, it's not going to individual colleges, it is going to all of them, is going to be about why am I well qualified for this subject? Um, and that will work for other places. So for a lot of European schools, you have to write a, what we might call a letter of motivation. It's going to be pretty much tailored to that course at that university. A lot of European universities won't actually ask you to write anything, which mm -hmm. is, yeah, also no need for a college essay guy over here. Um, but it's in an the, access yeah. issue, so I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, but it and, is, and I mean, you've got to imagine that your audience is a professor teaching that subject. So I tend to say to my students, imagine like a 60 year old white haired professor of the subject that you're applying for. Write the essay that's gonna convince them that you're a good student for the subject, which is different from writing to an admissions committee in a US liberal arts college. Who's 20 something, just, you know, four years out of college, yeah. you know, attended the school. And tell, I, I love the, your analogy of the um, making an argument in court. Give us, give us that ABC, I, I, I think that's a good one. Yeah, so the, the, what we talk about a lot, and particularly with, it's so, so difficult if you've grown up in one system to understand it. 
But what is the case you're trying to argue? So imagine, again, that 60-year-old you know, professor sitting there. They are the judge in the courtroom. You are arguing your case, and your case is, I should be admitted. And what should you be admitted for? Well, you should be admitted for the subject yeah. in the UK. Or maybe if you're looking at an IE in Madrid or Baconi, I should be admitted for this subject at your university. Well, the evidence you would lay before that judge has to be directly relevant. Otherwise, you would be thrown in contempt. you will be thrown out of the courtroom. We don't want to know about how good you are at hiking through the mountains. You're applying for history. Tell us about history. Yeah. Um, was again, equally in the other way, if you're applying to a lovely small little arts college, we want to know more about you. So what we then always talk about is, well, you're going to have to talk about stuff that you've done. So that is the evidence, the books that you've read, projects you've undertaken, the classes that you, you've studied. So for that is an activity, the A. Well, then B, how did it benefit you? And then, importantly, C, link it to the course. So if you love hiking and you're outdoorsy and you go and do that kind of stuff, that's great. Well, how did it benefit you? Well, maybe it introduced you to flora and fauna and the wonderful countryside that's out there, which makes you potentially well suited to studying biological sciences at University College London. Yeah. So for folks, and especially for counsellors who are on, who maybe may not be familiar with you guys, let's say, it's sort of like in college essay guys speak, it's like the what I did about what I did. And then there's the so what, which is like the values. And then there's like a mini why us. It's like, what is this? It's really a why major essay overall, yeah. but it's sort of like what in particular about this course, you know, really, really suits you. So yeah. it's sort of a mashup of these different essay styles. Yes, I mean, and different personality. An analogy I've started just using recently that occurred to me is that when you're working with someone like Ethan and we're doing US essays, it's like you're creating this beautiful oil painting of someone. You know, it's got texture and light and change. It's the best possible version of them. For UK and Europe, it's like a dot to dot. It's like an outline of who the person is. Yeah. And I find, I, I find actually that the U, University of California schools line up pretty well with the UCAS in terms of the, sub, the academic subject essay. So if there are counselors or students on who are applying to the University of California and you've got that essay or personal yeah. like number six, what academic subject? And it's like, how have you prepared in whatever you know major you're considering? That's a good one to potentially yeah. review. So you can, if you are applying to the UK, you can often shorten that one to 350 and just get that sort of bullet point version and make sure. In terms of like what you're saying, David, is like if we have a spectrum of information and poetry, you know, the the common app personal statement for the US might be, you know, a little bit here, it might be a little more poetic. We're over here for the UK. Yeah. Right? You've got a little poetry if it sounds nice, bonus points, but we really need to make sure. Like you said, yeah. we're making the argument. Poetry if you're applying for English literature, not if you're applying for physics. Yeah, right, right, right. It's straightforward, <laughs> just the facts. Yeah. Um, so what else, what else, what else? Um, and is it the same? Well, let's talk about what is a British degree like? And, yeah, um, and we'll get, I'm, I'm conscious I'm talking a lot about the UK. We'll get. We'll talk about European options as well, but I know it's a big popular thing. In fact, UCAS gave us data today that there is a 61% increase in applications from the US to the UK this year. Which wow. is amazing. Maybe there's Why stuff in getting... the US. I Maybe there's think... been stuff going on in America the last couple of months. Who knew? Um, but yeah, so typically, what well, in the UK we've actually got kind of two different models. So we've got Scotland, which I know is hugely popular from students in the US. St Andrews and Edinburgh and Glasgow have been recruiting in, in the US for many years, and then the rest of the UK, England, Wales, Northern Ireland is that three years single or joint honours degree in, in most cases where you are going to study something. Um, and typically you study for your first year, you have some, some exams, you know, a number of essays, papers to write in time conditions, sort of lengthier APs with that kind of multiple choice thing. No in-class assessment really, no attendance. If you get 40% in that first year, you, you pass, you move on. And then you study for another two years, there might be a capstone project, there might be some coursework. Um, you know, potentially if you're doing a year abroad for language or a placement year, like a co-op program, it could be another year. But at the end of those that period, three years, you then do a bunch more exams and that's how you get your degree. Mm -hmm. So you are on this track of I've applied for this, I'm going to study this and I'm going to be examined in it. Scotland ever so slightly different because of various history, four year bachelor's degree. In Scottish universities and that fourth year means there is a little bit more academic flexibility so most Scottish universities you'll typically in your first year be able to take a couple of other subjects alongside the one you've been admitted to and possibly you were admitted to a joint degree when you went again in your second year do a little bit more and then in your third and fourth years you'd specialize in one or two areas certainly potentially you could end up getting your degree title in two subjects that you actually weren't admitted for um, depending on how it works at universities, but still a pretty academically focused degree in the UK. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And so you, we've been focusing on the UK. Let's let's expand it. I mean, and I don't want you, I don't we don't have to go whole world, but yeah. let's jump. Let's let's globe hop a little bit. So talk to us about some other programs. Just yeah. So know. Europe. I mean, there's 48 different higher education systems that have been harmonised kind of within the European Union and various other structures. So I can't give absolutely everything, but I want to touch on a couple of key options. I think people might might want to consider. Ireland is a really awesome option, which I think is kind of overlooked. Um, it's really up and coming. Brexit has changed the game for European students. Now, the UK is not in the EU in terms of funding and costing. So Ireland's really up. There was a, quite a significant rise in applications to Ireland. For slightly similar to the Scottish model, so slightly broader. For US citizens, you know, yeah, there's stuff just going on tonight from President Biden with some things going on with Seamus Heaney's wife. And just there's such a great cultural tie. So it feels very comfortable. Nice, small sector for universities is actually only at the moment 10 Irish universities. There's a few more coming soon, some things are changing. But there's some really lovely options study Trinity College Dublin, University College Dublin, Maynooth University have this most amazing Bachelor of Arts degree, which is inherently flexible. Um, so it's it's kind of nice, soft landing for an American. As I said, the costs are pretty reasonable. Cost of living, pretty good, actually. You know, Dublin will compare to most US cities in terms of your, your cost of living. And you get outside Dublin, significantly cheaper um so ireland if you want a really nice kind of overlooked hidden gem place and ireland will give you the right to stay for a couple of years once you graduate as well so well and and i want to speak to like the student who's on the call who's listening and who's like maybe they got the 3.7 gpa uh and they've got you know you know they've been involved in school they've been engaged and they're wondering one could i get into a college in ireland just broadly speaking is there a school that i could get into in Ballpark, what is it going to cost? So what yes. do you say to that student who's just sort of wondering, is this even feasible for me? I mean, yes, you will get in as long as, again, because it's transparent, the requirements, you look at, and all the universities publish it, like, what are they asking for? What's the GPA? Are they asking for an SAT or an ACT? Might they need some APs? I mean, historically, before the last month, SAT subject tests may be, you know, a subject prerequisite to know you're qualified to do it. And tuition fees, you know, something like $25,000 for yeah, Trinity College Dublin for most of their degrees. Medicine, a bit more expensive, mm -hmm. but yeah, about 25,000 US. 25 uh, for tuition and broadly speaking in terms of room and board, what's gonna be the total cost for a year in, in Ireland? Just yeah, well in Dublin it's quite expensive. So you could be paying, you know, maybe another 15 on, on top of that for, you know, board living costs. I mean, it depends whether you, you know, the joke of, you know, do you drink champagne or do you drink water? You know, and I'll say this here, lower drinking age in, um, in Europe than in the United <laughs> States. So that's why I make convention champagne, but a different model. But if you're if you're down in Cork, significantly cheaper for accommodation and cost of living. So by the time you factor it all in, it's gonna be shorter. Yeah. It's gonna be cheaper. So cheaper, right, 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 right. I mean, yeah. it sounds like in some cases, I mean schools are now 70, 80, you know, all in. So yeah. it sounds like in some cases it could be half as half as expensive to Yeah. To and bear in mind if you go to those places like the UK or most of the continent of Europe, it's only a three year degree over a four year degree. So it's cheaper and you're only paying for a year less. There we go. So instead of 70 times four, we're looking at maybe 40 to 50 times three, you know, Potentially. ballpark. Yeah, yeah. great. Give it great. Give us some other options besides. So another one that I think people kind of overlook, and this is where kind of a lot of the myths of like, well, how can I go and study in this country? It's not an English speaking country. There are wonderful places all over Europe where actually English is incredibly well spoken. The Netherlands is one I kind of really want to highlight. Mm -hmm. um, so I lived in Belgium. I lived in the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. It was basically impossible to try and speak Dutch. I don't really have much, but I didn't pick up any because everybody speaks English. Mm -hmm. Ethan or like this because we both got young kids. In the Netherlands, they don't dub their kids TV. They subtitle it. So from as soon as kids can watch cartoons on the TV, they are getting English lessons because mm -hmm. they're reading the Dutch and hearing English. So it's extraordinarily high levels of fluency. And the Netherlands has well over 300 degrees taught entirely through the medium of English. Um, you have got a, a small group of liberal arts colleges in the Netherlands. So you can go and study a US style um, degree, but then they've got really world famous research universities, Leiden and Maastricht and Utrecht. They've got some really interesting hands-on applied sciences universities. And if you're really interested in things like security studies or the legal system, well, you've got the Hague and the International Criminal Court. You want to study like international logistics and business. You've got Rotterdam with this massive port stuff mm -hmm. going on. Yeah, you want to study anything to do with like renewable and sustainable energies or water. The Dutch engineering schools are awesome for that kind of stuff. And, and seeing, I spent, I've got some good friends who live in Amsterdam, and seeing a culture that that practices what they preach. In other words, that's bike heavy. You know, if, yeah. if you like riding bikes and you like 
sort of that it's a little bit for me it's a little bit slower pace from living in los angeles you know that it's a different vibe but it's, it's yeah. beautiful yeah and so a really awesome place very transparent outcomes um very egalitarian society so you can potentially surprise yourself at how easy it might be to get into most courses at most dutch universities um and it's kind of a nice landing if you want the safety of knowing i'll get by in english but it is a completely different culture and you have to get your head into that so definitely worth looking into another one i think this is a really interesting one as well is there's a massive sector of european business schools yeah again really well established world well place but if you are that student who knows i want to go and study business that is what I want to do. It can be quite hard in the US to actually really get a properly focused business curriculum. You know, we can talk about some of the places which will do a direct entry BBA and the numbers for those places in the US are off the charts competitive. Mm -hmm. But there are great schools. I mentioned Bacconi in Milan, IE in Madrid, ESCP, the world's oldest business school, has a Bachelor of Management where over your three year degree you will live in three different European cities. That's neat. All taught in Europe. Yeah, amazing place. I could go on and on talking about those business schools, but they are unbelievably fantastic options. And the networking of these places is, mm -hmm. is unbelievable because as well as you're there doing your BBA, you've got people doing their Masters in Management, their Masters in Finance, their MBAs, their executive education courses. I think the new Italian government had five Bocconi graduates and one professor in their new government. So really powerful options. So if you've got somebody who really wants to do business, Mm -hmm. those European options are, are really interesting places to go and consider. One thing I was going to say, one thing I imagine students wondering about is how do employers post-college view, say, a degree from, you know, somewhere in the Netherlands or somewhere in the in the UK? What is, you know, I have sort of my own response and how I view it, but what is what has been your experience and what do you tell students when they ask things like that? How are they going to, what are they going to think if they, maybe that maybe the employer, for example, hasn't heard of the university? What is, yeah. what is I mean, so th there is one little potential glitch in a very small number of cases that's probably worth flagging up, that there are some state university grad schools, which because of rules written into state law must have a four-year bachelor's. Mm -hmm. And so for, for if you are potentially aiming to go to this particular grad school, it might be worth just having a little look at that because that can potentially be a glitch. If that's not you, and that's in a very mi small minority of cases, then I'd say there's a couple of things. The first thing is, it says something about you that aged 18 or 19, you went to the other side of the planet yes. to go and do something. And that soft skills is in there. Yes. And to be honest, if an employer doesn't value that, it's probably not a company you'd probably be Probably not where you want to work. <laughs> yeah, so there's that. The second thing is, that we may have mentioned, there is this thing called grad school. So even if you've gone to a, a school in Europe, which you think doesn't have name brand recognition, and that's yeah, per perfectly normal, but universities know other universities. Um, Harvard Law School has a great thing they publish every year. I think it's like 176 universities this year that they've accepted students on into their JD programme. Have a look at it. There's a bunch of UK and European schools on there. Grad school admissions officers know international news. So if you're thinking, I still want that name brand, I still want that, well, come back to the US and do grad school. And, and oh, look, my bank balance is actually going to be able to enable me to fund grad school a little bit more because I've saved a bit of money. Right. I mean, when, and my one person opinion on this is like when I hear that a student or an adult has gone to school overseas and didn't go through sort of the typical route, I go, I lean in. Tell me more. You know, what was that experience like? Why did you choose that? And it's to me, that's a huge conversation starter. So anyway. Yeah, it's not I mean, it's not for everybody. And there's all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't. But the barriers are not as big as people think. And that's a really, that's a parent question. And actually, the, thing, the other thing I will chuck in there, and I don't know how many parents have got on the calls, but typically people tend to meet somebody else at college. And so actually the kid might not come back. <laughs> this is a great, so this segues into who is this not for? So it's, it's and I, there's not a specific answer for that, but you know, is, is there, is there, a, is, can we, is there, who, who might be better suited to sort of, and maybe students are already sort of know and they wouldn't be on this call potentially. But is there, are there other things that you could ping for for students who, you know what, maybe you mentioned, you know, potentially pursuing a grad degree if it's a very small yeah. grad program. Are there any others that you can think of who might not? I mean, if you really want to, you know, to, to do a degree that qualifies you to do something, that's a big difference, U.S. versus almost the rest of the world, is there are a lot of things that in the U.S. you can only do at grad school. You can do in a single or joint honours in the U.K. So I mentioned it already, medicine. Yeah, you can study medicine in the U.K. and Europe straight from high school. Mm -hmm. um, same for law and other things. Now, actually, you've got to understand, well, what does that qualify me to practice in different parts of the world? So there's potentially some stuff there. You know, Qualifying as a doctor is different from getting a history degree. History degree, you can go anywhere and talk about history. Qualifying as a doctor, you need to be aware of the legal framework. So there's that. If you are someone who actually 
you do need that kind of bigger wraparound nurturing. You need to have that small classes, knowing the professor, that kind of relationship stuff. That is not something that the UK or Europe does very well. And there are some places, but it's not the same as, as in the US. And if actually a big part of your reason to go to college isn't necessarily the academics, it's that kind of school spirit, varsity sports, the theatre programme, all that kind of stuff. Again, you're going to a UK or European school to study the subject. You know, we do not have stadium with 110,000 seats in it. You'd be lucky if three men and a dog turn up to watch a varsity team play a game. Um, and our sports are different. So that kind of stuff, if that's that what you want, then that's not really what you're going to find in most places over here. Mm -hmm. I did find, I'll say this to offer a small counterpoint, I did find that there was a community that was created, but it did feel different. It didn't feel, it felt very held and sort of like we're all spending our time together, whereas it felt like we were all students individually, but going, and this was in London, but it was going to school in a city. But I had, to, I feel like I had to work a little bit harder. And also because in the dorm that I happened to live in, it was all singles. And so, it, I, you know, there wasn't that. You know, oh, well, that, that is a good point, actually. I always forget this one. We don't do roommates typically over here. And that, you are on your own. it's a small thing, but I, it, that ended up creating, you know, we had, again, you just had to come out of your room and, you know, make a bigger effort. But um, yeah. so talk to us a little bit about, well, first of all, before we move on to application timelines, are there any other options that you want to sort of ping for folks, you know, that are kind of in your mind? I mean, there is so much out there. Um, yeah, so much out there. So even if I haven't mentioned something, I've seen we've got some questions coming in about Yeah, Norway. we're going to get to all the questions. Not all the questions, but we're going to get to the questions in there about 12 minutes. So much out there. Um, yeah, and in most cases, there will be stuff you'll be able to find. I can't, I can't cover anything. But if you do have a really niche interest in a language, or niche interest, I'll say, to a US audience, in yeah, language or you know, something like medicine, you really want to be in Poland or whatever, it is all out there. Just get hold of one of us afterwards and we can start to direct you to some resources. This is important. We kind of lump Europe together because it is so similar in many ways, but it, every different country has a slightly different system. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about timeline then. When, when, when do students apply? How do they go through the process? Walk us through it. Yeah, so actually on the student point of view, in most cases, you've actually got the easier side of this. The challenge I know with a lot of, lot of counsellors joining us here is actually a lot of what's going to have to be provided is kind of countercultural for the high school. So the timelines in terms of actually what you mechanically have to do at a certain time, you kind of need to prep the high school before it, because you might be the only student from your high school that year or for a number of years mm -hmm. applying outside the US. And so that relationship is why, you know, for us, it's really important that we have some of our, our US memberships that we can talk to a high school counsellor and say, look, there's these things called predicted grades. And I know you've never predicted for an AP that the kid's been in class for, for three weeks, but you're going to have to and find a way of, of being able to do that. Most of the process you're going to be applying starting in the fall of your senior year. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some potentially early deadlines that might fall in that October. So things like Oxford and Cambridge and medicine might fall in that. Most deadlines are going to fall kind of in January of your senior year. So Ireland, the rest of the UK beyond those programmes, a lot of the Dutch programmes. But there are actually many countries. You know, I saw a student earlier today who wants to apply for medicine in Italy. She can't even take the test for that until September mm -hmm. for her to go to the college in the October. Right. So she can't even apply until basically she's graduated high school. And that's common in a lot of Central and Eastern European countries. So it's kind of over that kind of process, but it's typically going to run slightly later. Mm -hmm. So US, what I will flag though, is that there are a couple of European universities, particularly those private business schools, which are open now for 2022 entry. So you could be in the middle of your junior year and you can have your college offer secured before you even finish junior year for where you're going after you graduate. So there are little differences, but typically, ideally, you want to, by the time you go on that kind of summer break, you want to know where you're going and want to have got your high school teed up to get ready for you to go. And then you come back in, in the fall and hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it seems, I mean, it seems like on the one hand, students are going to need to do a little bit of work to educate, not educate their counselors, but to inform their counselors of certain, like the student sort of has to run it just a bit more. Whereas with counselors, you know, applying in the US, if your counselor isn't aware of these things. And so, first of all, a good question just to say to students is like, ask your counselor, you know, hey, have you had, you know, folks apply to in the past to different schools? You know, where, what are they familiar with? Because if not, then it might be some more of like, hey, just making, keeping an eye out for those deadlines and things. Yeah. It makes I'm me think, go ahead. So it's just that little things that, again, we were saying earlier, football versus football, we use the same language to describe different things. Like if you go and ask a US teacher for a, a reference letter, you're going to get this peon to who the student is in your classroom. 
And I'm going to look potentially if we're allowed to look at that and go, well, can you delete 90 percent of that, please? Mm -hmm. Because we don't care whether you're a nice person or not. We care how good you are at the subject. Yeah. And so that's a horrible thing to drop on an overworked, you know, in normal times. I mean, right now, gosh, an overworked class teacher trying to juggle Zoom and their kids and all this kind of stuff. You need to have sympathetically got them ahead of this. And, yeah, I say this very genuinely to the US families we work with. We'll probably end up doing more work with your high school to help you with this than we will with you because mm -hmm. you're in this and you get it. They're having to juggle all these different things and we're asking them to do something completely different, which actually glitches with some of the things they actually think are important in education, mm -hmm. like telling a kid 10 months before they take a test what school we think you're going to get. Mm -hmm. When, yeah, and, and by the way, I mean, I just want to say to students again, don't assume that your counselor doesn't know. Just yeah. ask. Because your counselor very well may be incredibly well versed Absolutely. in this whole process and, yeah. and can know all the things. Um, and so timeline, it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is like the timeline is it depends on the school, right? It depends on the. the it's, it's definitely going to be less work than applying to a bunch of US schools. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that is the case. You know, and you've got the nice way coming in. When I speak to my British kids who apply to the US, they've got, you know, they're the ones with the raw deal against all their UK friends staying here. If you're the one kid in your US high school applying to the UK, you'll be seeing everyone else stressing themselves out. You could have all your offers by Christmas. You could be done. And you've written one essay. Mm -hmm. right. you know, that's a nice deal. Right. Um, I want to shift to Q&A here in uh, a couple minutes. Is there anything else that we've missed so far in terms of the stuff that we said we were going to talk about? I'm trying to call back to our board. Let me have a little uh, The only other thing I would mention it is, is Oxford and Cambridge, I think is possibly worth touching. Because a lot of yeah, people yeah. kind of aspire to those places. And it's something I have personal knowledge of. I've been graduate myself and counseled lots of students into both universities. I think it's really important that we kind of separate those out from other systems because they are almost unlike any other university on the planet. Um, for again what are you applying for yes you're applying to study a subject but it's taught in such a different way so if you go to oxford or cambridge your teaching process is one-on-one -on -one, two-on-one sometimes three-on-one for an hour once a week with a world-leading professor of that subject now you go to any top university in any other country the closest you get to the world leading professor is the standing at the front of the lecture hall mm -hmm not at Oxford Cambridge, it is that intensive. I remember one-on-one -on -one having seven weeks of tutorials, what these are called at Oxford, with the guy who had literally written the book about Henry V, which was what I was studying. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's extraordinarily intensive, and therefore they have extra selection procedures mm -hmm. because it's not just being super smart for the subject, but to be able to do it in a way where you can actually sit in a room with someone and basically argue with them when you spent five days studying this and they spent 50 years doing mm -hmm. it. Um, slightly different timelines, extra tests and things. So it's slightly different. Um, I will also say, and sometimes freaks people out a bit, neither Oxford or Cambridge are the most selective UK universities for the simple fact is you're not allowed to apply to both. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they divide themselves in half. Um, Imperial and London School of Economics are actually the most selective because you can apply to those. Mm -hmm. we, one thing you mentioned different, you know, things, things, things for the application. Will you say just a, a word about interviews, about how interviews are different for U.S. versus U.K.? Yeah, so most places you won't have an interview um, for the vast majority. Um, Oxford and Cambridge will interview for everything. Um, and again, it's it's that subject specific focus. It is trying to show that you can think in the way someone needs to for that subject. So I've got the book up here from my friend Sarah, again to Oxford Cambridge, the famous question of, you know, tell us about a banana. Ethan, tell us about a banana. Well, how you yeah, right. might tell me about a banana, someone with your academic background, was how a, someone going for biochemistry might talk about a banana. Me as a historian, I might want to talk about the impact of banana exports on political development in Central America. Yeah, an economist will talk about a banana in a different way. So that's kind of an Oxford Cambridge. Medicine, dentistry vet will also interview, but typically in different ways. Um, I won't bore you with going on with, with things, but in effect, you're going to perhaps have little stations. You might have eight four minute interviews, one to draw out your empathy, one to draw out your biological knowledge, one to draw about your people skills, all these kind of things. Um, but most cases, you won't get an interview. Yeah. Yeah. And and one of the things, you know, in terms of relative importance, in some cases, you know, in, in the U.S. university, sometimes students really panic about it. But, you know, it, it maybe matters a little bit less. It's with an alum here. It maybe matters a little bit more because, again, they're looking for data points 
in terms yeah. of information that's going to give them the evidence that you can really succeed. I mean, we I see it on UK school websites and they email me asking, so we've got a student who's got an interview at Stanford, he's got an interview at Harvard, like it's getting an interview at Oxford Cambridge, which is a thing, you should celebrate that. I say, well, everybody gets an interview and it's not with an admissions officer. And again, football and football, same things, completely different contexts. Yeah. Well, let's jump into some questions. Um, thank you, Ashley, for posting these. We have a Google Doc here. Um, let's take turns grabbing some of these. I, the, the first one, it sounds like the first the student who asked this question, David, is looking for a way to sort through universities and is asking about, are there any established publications that rank universities? And how would you, you know, how would it, an international student go about creating a short list? So it, this makes me think that there's a guide coming that we should probably <laughs> put together. But what in terms of rankings, we, we don't love rankings. Yeah. And they're problematic for all kinds of reasons, which you can Google your annual reminder to ignore the U.S. News and World Report rankings. But in, in, when students are trying to launch, how do they launch into sorting through all these schools? Yeah, I mean, rankings are just kind of a hook to hang something on to start with. They are a useful starting point to know what's out there. On the global thing, you have the Times Higher Education World University Rankings. You have the QS World Rankings, which are just pretty decent starting points, at least to see how something compares to something you might know in the US. Obviously, there are different types of things. But if you're looking at kind of a couple of schools in the US, you think those are sort of the right place for me. Well, where else ranks near them are on the world stage? When you start to delve into particular countries, then it gets a little complicated because different countries have different senses of how you might choose between universities. So a lot of European countries, every university is as good as each other because you just go to your local university because mm -hmm. a lot of them actually are designed in that way. So why would you have rankings? Because they're all just good. Um, in places like the UK and Ireland, we do have rankings. The UK, lots of the big newspapers, makes money for newspapers, have rankings. Mm -hmm. The one I like for the UK is called the Complete University Guide because actually the universities participate in that themselves. And it also has subject rankings. How would you go about getting an international student creating a shortlist? I mean, this is why people like us exist, because it, it's complicated. It's not secret, it's just complicated to try and get your wealth through it. As ever, find something you like the idea of and look it up. I am a huge fan now of YouTube as a way of conducting college research. It turns out teenagers like videoing themselves and posting it on YouTube. I mean, that, that seems to be a really important thing. And you can Google, What's it like to go to college with the name of the college? And you'll find people talking through that. And you can do a little bit of that. And if you found it, I like the sound of that, then Google is also great because then colleges like wherever. And you can start to work it out that way. So the rankings are a decent place to start. What you will also find is every country will have some kind of government website which does talk you through these things. So you've got, you know, studyinholland.nl for example, for options in there, and so on and so forth, studyinisland.ie. And those are portals where you can start to get a sense of those mm -hmm. kind of things. Some of these we've covered a bit, you know, what is the academic vibe and how is it different? Um, can you talk about what it's like to apply for the arts and music in the UK? Yeah, I mean, actually, this is where UK and US are quite similar because you were admitted based on that competency. Um, so very similar, art portfolio based, music audition based. Um, timelines a little similar to kind of what I mentioned, slight different quirks and those kind of things they tend not to have a pre-screen in the UK. Um, so you are admitted to that program. They want to see your coursework, you know, you playing the violin, you doing sculpture, whatever it might be. Two key differences. The UK is a little bit more about process rather than US tends to be a little bit more about the final standard of what you've achieved. So if you've got an art portfolio, you might want to just slightly rejig how you're presenting it because the UK will want to know maybe four pieces that then led to that final piece where the US might just want to see, see that final piece. So definitely something there just to, to kind of consider in terms of, of how you're looking at it. The second thing is going to be that actually for some of these programs, because of the nature of how different curriculums match up, you might find yourself having to take what we would call a foundation year, like a bridging year, um, particularly in something like art, where you might not know whether you want to do sculpture or textiles or, or printmaking, whatever. So a lot of the, the art schools, Central St. Martins, for example, best, best highest ranked art school in the UK, basically everyone who's going there goes into the foundation program first, do more art, work out, and then go. Um, the other one I'll chuck in there is drama. A lot of people want to go to places like RADA and Lambda for, for acting and things. Though those are bachelor's degrees, people tend to have already done a bachelor's degree somewhere else first. Yeah. Um, because the, le the amount of body of work you have to have done, the maturity you need to do that. Yeah, there are possibilities too, just in terms of drama, to study 
you know, there are so many programs that have study abroad programs. If you end up studying in the U.S. and you want to study, do a summer in, in you know, in England, yeah. for example, and do a, a summer program at RADA. Absolutely. But those are pretty selective sometimes. Um, which countries are particularly LGBTQ friendly? What is your sense of this? Well, I mean, so Western Europe, I would say as a whole, a lot of Central and Eastern European, though, if anyone's following some of the politics of what's going on in some of those parts of the world now, you'd be able to kind of draw a conclusion from there. Um, but universities generally over here are extraordinarily liberal places and the UK on the whole is a pretty liberal country. I mean, Western Europe as well, generally. I mean, most most politicians in any Western European political party would all be in the Democratic Party mm -hmm. in the US just because of how the political dialogue is about. And that kind of reflected in universities. And then anywhere that's a big city is going to be more friendly. Um, mm -hmm. Not saying anywhere that's rural and country is going to be unfriendly. But anyway, if you look at just some of the government policies of these kind of things, um, you just notice some of the massive differences of just, you know, prominence of, of politicians from the LGBTQ plus community. You know, I'm former T-shirt, the prime minister, you know, just as an example that comes to the top of my mind. It's, it's just a slightly different context over here. Mm -hmm. A couple kind of quick fire procedural things that are probably quick answers. What's the limit to the number of schools you can apply to? I'm not sure if you said that. Yeah, yeah so if the, the UK limits you to five. The rest of the world, the rest of Europe, there are some places that have limits. Ireland limits you to 20. <laughs> you have 20 courses. Um, Netherlands, four, and some nuance within that. Other places, as many as you want to. Great. What about double majoring? Is it possible to double major in the UK? Well, do we call it joint honours. And that would be either something and something, so history and politics, which would be an equal split, or something with something. Different universities do it. So, like, um, philosophy with physics. Um, and I know there's another question here about like you just go and study one thing and get yeah I'm, I'm a history teacher by training so analogies imagine you're going out for like a, a, a particular country's cuisine yeah if you're going out for an Italian food you would expect to be given Italian food that is the UK and European system the US is like a crazy buffet mm -hmm. there's just every type of food in front of you and that's a US liberal arts curriculum and so if that analogy kind of helps you're getting what you ordered from a UK or European school mm -hmm. Uh, is it hard to transfer to a UK European school from a community college? Um, it's not It's not hard to transfer. You'll have to do a little bit of legwork just making sure whether you're eligible. Because, again, of this fact that if you are going into, probably you go into year two of a three-year degree, just in terms of how it works out. But have you done enough that the UK student would have done in that first year? Because, mm -hmm. again, with two different systems, yeah, I did three years of just history at Oxford. So I've probably done more history than equivalent, you know, my clone Ethan at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. But I haven't done it. If I was coming to Northwestern, I haven't done any of those gen eds. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So it kind of matches up. So it's definitely possible. It's where you want to communicate with someone from the, the recruitment offices and just saying, look, is this worthwhile? We do it. You have to understand that there's going to be some little quirks in the process. Mm -hmm. Yep. What, what advice, this is a kind of a tricky one, advice for U.S. students now that the subject tests have been discontinued and no longer available? Yeah, I mean, that was, a, I'd say, a big surprise for a lot of us helping students in the U.S. come over to, to the U.K. and Europe, and actually for a lot of universities. Um, I was in contact with um, the chap at College Board who organised this kind of stuff, and he was, I think, a little bit surprised just potentially what a big deal it was. Because of this idea of a single honours or joint honours focus and a three-year focus degree, the universities need to know that you've, you've got enough knowledge. Yeah, You can't go in to study mechanical engineering at TU Delft or, or you know, the Carl Benz School of Engineering in Germany without being pretty good at maths and physics. And so the universities will then look at your externally assessed test scores. Mm -hmm. So that used to be APs and SAT subject tests. And actually, subject tests were great for applying to the UK and Europe because you could take them again and again until you've got them. The Again, another analogy. Imagine you've got three targets you have to knock down. A UK or most European students might have only three balls to knock those targets down. They've got three tests to get three sets of grades. The American kid could have had 18 or 20 because they could just keep taking the tests. Mm -hmm. Subject test going causes quite a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, universities are still going to work that out. What I imagine we'll see is more of a reliance on looking at honours classes, um, APs, possibly CLEP, which I know is not qualification that's done very often but that might be something that could serve that but universities because they're admitting you for a course they absolutely have to have some external verification that you are good enough to do it mm -hmm. and particularly in something like a science course or math course where there is a, a generally accepted body of knowledge they can't admit you if they don't know you've got that body of knowledge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it's tricky. It sounds like it's tricky. And it's they're working it out. Yeah, yeah. The, they'll work it out. So it's a little bit, I, I would say to the person who asked that, it's a little bit TBA. It's it's hard to know. Um, yeah, it was better than being a high school senior now, and we've got plenty of them who have offers in the UK conditional on them going on to achieve a score in a test which no longer exists. Now, that is a slightly stressful situation, and we are working that one through. Oh, my God. So question from a counselor. What's the best way for a counselor who's familiar with the US system to learn about the UK system? I mean, in normal times, come and visit us. It's nice. Um, we'll give you scones and cream and jam and, and all that kind of fun stuff. But yeah, generally, if you can, come and have a visit. Um, speak to friendly university reps. People like me, we're happy to come, you know, give virtual talks to schools. But a lot of European, um, UK universities are active in NACAC, um, in HECA, in IECA. A lot of people have reps based in the United States. They'd love to come and give talks to you and your students, answer questions. Um, I'll give a shout out to the International Association for College Admissions Counseling. So it's the international branch of NACAC for counselors who will know what NACAC is. You can join that. And there's a bunch of resources. Um, but have fun going on the internet. You know, if you're curious, go and read up on these kind of things. Um, and buy Ethan's book with the chapter. Where is it? Over here. <laughs> chapter on uh, that way. Study. Sell that. That's yeah. okay. You don't need to buy that. Um, uh, what? And, and uh, what I'll say too is like, there, what's one of the benefits of the pandemic is there are these college fairs where, you know, I, I mean, it's so overwhelming when you go to a national conference. You, everybody in the room just kind of talking at you. But in these virtual situations, I've seen so far. So, for example, NACAC is going to be hosting a series of virtual college fairs coming up really soon. We'll put the word out about. And there you've got an opportunity to meet, you know, four or five different folks in the space of, a couple, you know, an hour and a half yeah. or so. So that's one thing that I would suggest is like signing up for these virtual college fairs and, and just going and chatting with reps and doing a quick tell me about tell me about yourself kind yeah. of interview. yeah well i will flag in that something again another cultural difference in the uk and europe admissions and recruitment tend to be two different departments was obviously most people in the us the person who's going to stand behind the table at a fair is also the person admitting students from that region and reading applications in the uk those tend to be different again admissions because it's linked to academics might actually be a professor so you've got full-time professional recruiters, which gives them perhaps a little bit more availability to come and do these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what are the, I've been hogging, what, what do these sound interesting? Let's let you scan our list here and pick one. Have, I'm, I'm fascinated seeing people answering everyone else's questions in the chat here. Thank okay. you to everyone who's, who's weighing in there. Some great answers coming up. And I'll agree for whoever's talked about Anglo-American University in Prague, it does not compare to Charles. Um, Okay, how is the cost of UK universities affected with Brexit? So Brexit is this thing that's, that's fascinating. As someone who lives in the UK, who's kind of lived through Brexit and then reads a lot of international press, one of these really different perceptions on it. Um, as an international student, it won't make any difference to the, to the cost whatsoever. But I'm going to use that to segue into a broader point of passports that you as a student hold could potentially bring the costs down even further. Um, different countries have different rules on this. But if you are in the US and you have an EU passport, it doesn't matter if you've not lived in the EU, you've not paid taxes there. There are many European countries, Netherlands again as an example, which will pay, you will pay a significantly cheaper fee because you have that EU passport. Other places it won't make a difference. If you're British and you've never lived in the UK, that passport makes no difference. You're still an international. So again, a little bit of nuance in there to have a look at. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So if someone's asking, can you, can you talk more about, well, Alice, I think we talked about the application process. Alice, let us know specifically what you want to know, because I think we covered that a little bit, but please, is, if there's more that you want to I mean, know. I can go on and on and on on different things, but I, I'll say our website, like Ethan's, we're not anything like as good as his, but the universityguys.com, there's a little search button on there. And if you search for a country in there, hopefully you'll find some resources. We search for Germany, we've got podcasts and blogs and these kind of things. So if we haven't covered your country and it's kind of a major is destination, I'll be honest, if you put Bulgaria in there, there's nothing up there in Bulgaria. But Germany, Spain, Italy, I've been checking India's in there, the, you know, Hong Kong's in there. So have a look on universityguys.com. We try and have a lot of, of accessible resources on there. Um, that box so that you all can check that out. Thank you. Let me have a look in there. Um, what is the best way that find schools that cater your chosen subject of study? I love this. That's a question to kind of work out what you're looking for. It read, a, you know, read some books or some articles and some blogs or right now podcasts and, and things about that subject from the UK or from the Netherlands, or whatever, and then find out where the person who did that went to school themselves. That's a really good starting point. If you love, you know, 
a really interesting historian or a biologist or someone talking about you know vaccines and the pandemic google them whether that person goes to school there probably are professors there and that's a good starting point to think about well, where must be good for that subject mm -hmm. Oh, Alice, I see your question now. How exactly do you apply? Is there a website where you submit all your grades, classes, and essays? So it's going to depend on the, the, on the system, country. On yeah. The country, right? Yeah. So for some places, it's centralized. So for the UK, it's centralized. There are actually, um, I think, it's like 22 UK schools that are on the Common App. So you can actually use the Common App. And I think there's another sort of 16 or so EU schools on the Common App. So you can use that. But if you're doing more than one UK, you should go straight to. Um, to UCAS. For the Netherlands, and things called Study Link. France has a centralized system. Sweden has a centralized system. Most other places, as a US student, will be applying directly to each university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so many beautiful, like, I wish we had more time. We've got about three minutes. So I'm trying to find the ones that will be. Oh, so many people are saying that link didn't work for some reason. We'll follow up. Don't worry. We'll send it to you via. It's very simple. The, the universityguys.com, the, the cheaper British version of, of Ethan's website. <laughs> um, which of these? Let's see. Can you change majors or are you stuck with that subject? That's a good question. Yeah, typically, you're, I mean, if it's the you know, Scottish model, I said Irish model, some of the liberal arts and sciences college in the Netherlands, yes, you have flexibility. In most cases, no, because you were admitted for that program. And that's where this subject prerequisites comes in. Yeah, I got in for history because I was good at history and I had you know, good grades in writing subjects in history. Um, I can't then suddenly say I'm also qualified to study physics because I don't have the content. I don't have the subject requirements for that kind of stuff. So typically, no. If you get to a UK school and you don't like the subject, people quit and reapply. Same for most European countries. In fact, in a lot of public European systems, the system is almost designed for you to have a go at something for a year, realize you don't like it and fail out and then start again. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to grab a couple more. Thanks, Emily, for jumping in here. Emily Dobson's answering some questions, too. Feel free to answer. We're not going to get to all of them. So I can see Emily. I can see John C. in there. Hello, John. Is John there, too? Cool. Hi, John. Um, mm -hmm. all right, this is Look into your crystal ball, David. Are they going to continue asking for test scores? More yes. schools than you have David says yes. Um, we'll get, we'll get, I mean, because so I, again, I think this will be my doctorate one day. University mission system has to reflect the high school system of the country it's designed for. Mm -hmm. And so in Western Europe, well, in all of Europe and the UK, we have credential heavy high school curriculums. We have standardized government mandated systems, which leads to a qualification. And that is how you get to college. Um, so in the UK, most people will do three A levels. So for your last two years of high school, you just do three classes and then you get test scores in those. That is what our system is designed for. That is what the vast majority of people are applying with. So you kind of have to backwards engineer international qualifications into that. The Netherlands with the different diplomas, same idea. So no, the UK can't go test option in the same way the US has done. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We've got people upvoting other, others' questions. Here's an incredibly specific one. I don't know if we have time to get into it. Natalie asks, can you explain why Anglo-American University Prague is not as good? Did you say that? I'd say it's a different kind of school. So we've, what we've got to understand is you're talking about an American accredited private university and the Charles University in Prague, which is a Czech university. So maybe I was being slightly flippant, but they are different kinds of programs. But I would say just look at the admissions requirements in there. They can be in particular circumstances one might be better better than the other anglo-american but charles is one of the oldest most prestigious universities in europe today the world um with you know four different medical faculties just you know four different bits of medical schools that it's got so it's an unbelievably prestigious university it is like the harvard yale princeton stanford of the country Here's a good one from Emily. Emily, this is from Emily Dobson. We might close with this one. Can you talk about open days and other ways of reaching out to school reps? Great idea. So for the counselors, International ACAC or IECA, HECA, these kind of things, you know, whatever professional organization you're part of, NACAC, there will be people listed for that kind of stuff. For a student, then there are opportunities to do it. If you go to any university website, you will find stuff there. They're all very well created to get you on there. But again, and I know I might be sounding flippant, but Google is your friend here. Google the name of the university and international office or American representative, and you will find very quickly that people are doing it. Yeah, it might just be USA at the name of the university dot ac.uk or .nl or whatever it is, but Google will help you get to that person, go from there. And no universities, you know, well, very few universities are going to ignore an email from there. And then that will enable you to get on some mailing lists to go on, on there. Instagram, 
Facebook, TikTok, some universities are on TikTok now, all those kind of ways of just seeing out there and then they will start spamming you. Yeah, exactly. And what's the likelihood, I mean, broadly speaking of that person potentially being the person that ends up reading your application, the person that you end up communicating with? Yeah, almost certainly not because recruitment and admissions being completely different. You probably will never know. And I'll also say, this may not be a thing to end up, your application might not actually be read. You know, you might just get in on your grades and there may be places where there is no application. I mean, you know, sometimes I speak to students in the US and they want to know, how do I make a strong application to such and such university? And so there is no strong application. You are getting in. Mm -hmm. You have a 100% chance of getting in because you meet their minimum requirements and that's how it works. That's Whether you stay in. That's mind blowing. Comparative outcomes. This is a phrase I think is really important. Come back to this big picture of like, why might you go? Transparency, you know, for potentially relatively little work, a good counselor can tell you where are you going to get in with almost absolute certainty in some of the UK and Europe to top 15, top 10, top five universities. Mm -hmm. No one can do that in the US. Yeah. Yeah. David, thank you. I so appreciate your wisdom and your always a pleasure, Ethan, your sense of humor. And everyone will follow up with email with resources from from David. And thank you, as always. And uh, we'll do it again sometime. That'd be fun. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Be well, friends. Bye bye.